So, dear rector, dear distinguished guests, dear professors and students, we welcome you all in this event. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Dam Roche uh, from Howard University to, uh, to deliver a lecture on English comparative and world literature. So, in the morning session, we had the pleasure of listening to a perfectly tailored seminar on the politics of global English. Let me, first of all, introduce Mr. Damrush to you. David Damrush is Ernest Birnbaum Professor of Literature and Chair of the Department of Comparative Literature at Harvard University. He was the president of the American Comparative Literature Association and is the founder and the director of the Institute of World Literature. He was trained at Yale and then taught at Columbia from 1980 until he moved to Harvard in 2009. He has written widely on issues in comparative and world literature and is the author of We Scholars Changing the Culture of the University, What is World Literature, How to Read World Literature, and various other works. New York Times called Mr. Damrosh an eloquent champion of world literature. His works has been translated into very many languages, such as Arabic, Turkish, Hungarian, Polish, and Vietnamese. Professor Danosh, thank you for accepting our invitation and visiting Azerbaijan Kafkas University. It's a great pleasure to see you among us. Well, now I'm inviting you to present your report on the English Comparative and World Literature. Thank you. America with a particular emphasis on uh, uh, American market, uh, England and America. So it's English, American, and world literature, effectively. Uh, and what I wanted to talk about uh, is, is the sort of interplay between a national literature and a world tradition, uh, and how comparative study can help us to think about our national traditions. Uh, I think uh, this morning, for those who were uh, here, I was saying briefly that um, no, no national literature ever develops by itself. Is that better? No national literature really develops on its own. With the possible exception of Sumerian literature in southern Mesopotamia 5,000 years ago and Old Kingdom Egypt, uh, because no one else knew how to write, those literatures were fairly independent. But already in Babylon, uh, by the uh, old Babylonian period, you start to have a multilingual literature between Sumerian and Akkadian, and you start to get interplay of different traditions within any one. And this is certainly the case, as I was mentioning uh, today, earlier with uh, Azerbaijan, so much a crossroads of cultures and literatures. Uh, and so for thinking about the relation of uh, national literature to world literature, uh, you can think of it as a, you can think, it's often done, that world literature is a large frame and then you have given nations inside. And in earlier generation, comparative literature, uh, the founders of the, of the discipline, thought that what you did was you had these national literatures and you compared them. There was French literature here, there was German literature here, there was Azerbaijani literature here, and you might do a comparative study of our literature, that literature, some third literature. But that assumes that there are national literatures. And the discipline developed in the late 19th century in what was a kind of a high water mark of European nationalism. And the assumption was you had a national literature written in the national language. But our literary histories tend to ignore this fact. Uh, there's a presumption that the national literature uh, is only the literature written in the language of that nation by citizens of that nation. And what I want to look at in this talk uh, is some, um, a couple of examples of, of works that sort of challenge that. So, and in some sense you can say then there's a kind of a figure ground reversal whereby you can think of world literature outside and the national literatures in that frame of the real world literature for you except uh, what is available here. Same thing in the United States. One of the things that means is there's no such thing as world literature in the singular. 
there are as many different world literatures as there are cultural spaces within which literature circulates differently. And in that process then, the relation of the world literature and the national literature sort of changes because the two are bound up together within the national space. And therefore, comparative literature has a rather different task than looking at freestanding separate literatures and comparing them. It's much more about uh, a symbiosis or an ongoing interaction. So to take some examples, my uh, opening slide here, uh, just a little uh, symbol to me of the penetration of the world into the nation. Uh, I took this picture a couple of years ago in, in the uh, bookshop of the Ho Chi Minh Palace Museum in Hanoi. So this is Ho Chi Minh, uh, and here you have him. This is a Chinese guide to his residence. It shows him sitting here. He looks like a Chinese poet or a Vietnamese poet, uh, and he might well have been writing Chinese poetry because Ho Chi Minh wrote Chinese poetry for his own pleasure. Uh, then, on the, then it looks like this could be the worst kind of Americanization going on. Again, the kind of uh, vulgar uh, American style. Here we have uh, Winnie the Pooh and Tigger uh, in the Disney Hollywood version of what was originally a British tale. Here we have a peculiar Abraham Lincoln looking like an Irish leprechaun. Uh, but in fact, it turns out what this was is a collection of Vietnamese stories for children. Uh, and the, uh, the Disney uh, image is just used uh, to kind of attract Vietnamese kids to read their own literature, not somebody else's literature. Lincoln is interesting uh, because during the Vietnam War, the Indochina War, uh, Ho Chi Minh and his friends often liked to compare uh, their struggle to the struggle of the American Civil War in which the North was freeing the South. And Ho Chi Minh saw himself as the modern Lincoln. So, uh, and this furthermore is interesting because what this is is a Vietnamese translation of a Korean life of Lincoln written in the form of a Japanese manga. So you have this sense of the totally international circulation uh, within uh, the museum of the leader, the founder of the, of the modern uh, Vietnam. But this is a much older process. Uh, and often, as I say, our literary histories tend to assume the only thing worth talking about is uh, something written in the supposedly singular national language. Uh, but this has never been altogether true. So uh, if you go back uh, to the early Renaissance, this is uh, Utopia, uh, uh, Utopia by Sir Thomas More, one of the classics of British literature, uh, but it's written in Latin. And it was not even published in England. It was published on the continent. Uh, about this imaginary island, he invents an imaginary alphabet of utopian, which is basically sort of looking vaguely Greek. Uh, it's only published in England, in English, uh, long after Sir Thomas More's death. At this, however, at least this gets adopted as part of the British canon because he was so famous. But less famous examples are equally interesting. Uh, there, there's the translation of, of More's Utopia. But what I want to talk about as a British example is this translation of this book. And what this is, is a very important uh, anti-imperial text uh, from the uh, 16th century, 1552, uh, called Le Brevissimo Relacion de la Destrucción de las Indias uh, by Bartolome de las Casas. And Las Casas was a Spanish uh, monk or priest friar uh, who was active in the New World during the early decades after the Spanish invasion and conquest of Mexico. Uh, and he writes this uh, treatise criticizing the excesses of the Spanish imperial adventure in Mexico and in the Caribbean islands. Uh, and it's about the, a, a brief relation about the destruction of the West Indies uh, by, uh, by the Spanish Empire. Now, Las Casas was himself part of the imperial uh, project, but he was trying to urge a kind of very strong reform uh, from the practices that he felt were destruction, destructive to the native population. So it's a kind of a plea for a more humane, a better uh, understanding of the people they're now ruling and a better treatment. Uh, now what's interesting is in the translation. This, uh, this is translated under interesting circumstances a century later, 1656. This is not the first translation, but the second translation uh, into English of this work by Las Casas. Uh, and uh, this is interesting uh, 
because my argument would be this actually becomes a work of English literature now. It's very different from the original one. Uh, this now uh, is commissioned by Oliver Cromwell, who is the Puritan revolutionary who is ruling England at the time. And the big, one of the big conflicts he's dealing with is conflict with the Spanish Empire. And the British are already uh, flexing their muscles, wanting to expand their uh, imperial uh, conquest. Uh, and they're fighting over the Caribbean islands against the Spanish. Uh, and Cromwell had recently sent a fleet to try to drive the Spanish out of the Caribbean, and they had been defeated. So then he decides to try literary means instead, propaganda. And uh, he uh, spoke to his, uh, one of his assistants, who was John Milton, the great British poet, author of Paradise Lost. Uh, and Milton got his nephew, John Phillips, J.P., uh, to retranslate Las Casas uh, into this version for present purposes uh, of attacking Spain. So now the, the destruction of the, India, of the Indies, Las Indias, becomes the tears of the Indians being an historical and true account of the cruel massacres and slaughters of about 20 millions of innocent people committed by the Spaniards in the islands of Hispaniola, etc., and the West Indies. And you see how large that is because that's what they cared about the most. Now this becomes then an attack on Spanish rule. Uh, and there are the illustrations, for example, here, the tears of the Indians or Inquisition for Blood being a relation to the Spanish massacres in those parts. Inquisition is very deliberately chosen because the Spaniards were famous for torturing and killing uh, people who weren't strict Catholic believers. The Inquisition was a religious attack uh, uh, on them. And, and here, this illustration makes the Spaniards start to look like the Aztec priests. They're, they're slaughtering people, they're cutting up their bodies, they're burning people. Uh, so it's very interesting. This translation becomes an outright attack on the Spanish Empire. This was not what Las Casas was doing. Las Casas was urging reform within the Spanish Empire. And Las Casas was, was a Catholic monk. He was absolutely not attacking Catholicism. Whereas the Protestant uh, Puritan revolutionaries are attacking Catholicism, the religion, as well as the uh, rival empire. So this becomes something completely different. Uh, and, and he has a preface to his translation in which John Phillips uh, compares, uh, compares the king of Spain to Satan. Uh, it's a satanic king who is, who is corrupting uh, the, uh, the, the new uh, world. Uh, now, what's interesting is that this not only becomes a new work in English translation, but it also enters, affects English literature, because having been commissioned by his uncle, John Milton, to do this translation, his uncle, John Milton, then paid a good deal of attention to that translation, and it is echoed in his masterpiece, Paradise Lost, uh, a decade later. Here, Adam and Eve uh, are just leaving, uh, have been thrown out of paradise after they eat the, the forbidden apple, uh, and they, uh, the Milton reflects, oh, how unlike to that first naked glory. They, they've now tried to cover themselves with, with fig leaves because they're so embarrassed. They now realize uh, they're naked because they've fallen out of innocence. Oh, how unlike to that first naked glory. Such of late Columbus found the American so girt with feathered cincture, naked else, and wild among the trees on isles and woody shores. Thus fenced, and as they thought their shame in part, covered but not at rest or ease of mind, they sat them down to weep. Not only tears rained at their eyes, but high winds worse within began to rise, high passions, anger, hate, mistrust, suspicion, discord. So the tears of the Indians are now the tears of Adam and Eve. And uh, not only had John Phillips compared the Spanish king to Satan, but at several points in the epic, Milton compares Satan to the Spanish king uh, implicitly. Satan tells his angels that he's going to conquer this new world to enlarge his empire. He literally says that. Uh, so it's echoing. So you have an interplay between the translation of Las Casas turned into a, an English uh, attack on Spaniard, uh, Spanish rule and on Catholicism, and then coming in to the Puritan uh, John Milton. It's very, very. So the, what I want to say: this has now become a work of British literature, is influencing one of the major masterpieces of British literature, and very appropriate that the, the way it describes translation made English by J. P. That means translated. But I think it actually really does mean it's been made an English work. So this is a case from uh, 500 years ago in which we see the interplay of, uh, of translation becoming part of the English tradition. 
but Las Casas is never included in any anthology of British literature because it wasn't originally written in Spanish. But the English translation <laughs> is now a work of English uh, literature. And indeed, the, the prejudice for the national language is such that John Milton, uh, his uncle, one of the great poets uh, of, of the English tradition, if you look in any anthology that I know of British literature, you will find Paradise Lost. You will find sonnets. You will find L'Allegro Penseroso. You will never find his Latin poetry because he wrote it in Latin. Well, he thought he wrote Latin very well. He was fluent in Latin. He spoke Latin. But because it was written in Latin, the British anthologies don't include it, even though it's by one of their major poets. Now, this that you see already in the, uh, in the Renaissance uh, is a multilingualism and a free movement of translation uh, that is being sort of more or less ignored by our own literary histories because we grow up in this world in which we think national traditions are separate and we have separate departments uh, by and large. So I think a lot of the task of comparative literature now is to open this out and think much more how multilingual uh, our nations are and also how translation works within the dominant languages. Uh, and we can look for modern examples as well. So it is always been recognized, or long recognized, that T.S. Eliot can be thought of as both uh, a writer, an American writer, and a British writer. You will find his poems uh, included in anthologies of American literature and anthologies of English, British literature. And no wonder. He, after all, for half of his life, he was a British citizen, and he has important writing both in England as an American citizen and in England as a British citizen. So at least we recognize where there's a common language, he can have a bi-national identity. But what of uh, Marie de France? Now, Marie de France was one of the most important women writers of the Middle Ages. Uh, and she wrote in Anglo-Norman, that is to say, in the kind of France being written in England. She, made, she lived in England most of her life. Uh, she built on British themes for her, for her poems. Uh, and yet, though she was active her entire life in Britain, she is never, almost never discussed by British scholars, almost entirely discussed by French specialists, even though her name, Marie de France, means Marie from France. No writer active in France would ever be called Marie de France. Should have been Marie de Paris, Marie de Rayon, Marie from whatever city she's from, not Marie de France. Uh, so she, just because she writes in, wrote in French, she's almost never discussed uh, in English departments. Uh, and you can see this also in, in quite modern authors as well. So Vladimir Nabokov uh, emigrates, uh, 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 leaves Russia after the Russian Revolution, first goes to Europe, and then makes, makes his career uh, in the United States after writing several novels uh, in, in Russian uh, and some stories in German and French, he moves, and then starts writing in English. Becoming famous was Lolita, published in the mid-1950s. He was on the cover of a major magazine. The novel is alive and living in America, uh, in anti-terra, a sort of anti-America that he's invented. Here he is with butterflies, uh, scrabble pieces in, in Cyrillic, uh, and you have uh, the Kremlin in the very far in the background. Here he is. He's recognized as an American author by now. But what of Marguerite Yourcenar? Now, she's a name you, you may well not know. Does anybody know her name? Um, she was a very important writer in the middle of the 20th century, French uh, writer. She was the first woman ever elected to the Académie Française, the great sort of the 40 immortals who are the great writers and protectors of the French language. But Marguerite Yourcenar, just like Nabokov, moved to the United States and made most of her life in the United States. The last 40 years of her life, she was living uh, in the United States. Uh, wrote several novels, including her most I I I famous novel, the one that made her famous, which is called Les Mémoires d'Adrien. This is a historical novel uh, uh, telling, uh, sort of put as the memoirs of the Emperor Hadrian, who is writing a letter to kind of his prospective heir, Marcus Aurelius, talking about his life and, and the challenges of ruling the, British em the, the, the Roman Empire uh, and the kind of uh, sexual politics and cultural uh, uh, ethnic politics he's, he's encountering. It's a beautiful, beautiful novel. And Hadrian himself is also a poet uh, and an esthete. But this she wrote after World War II when she was in, uh, in America, writing it mostly in, in the state of Maine. 
and in Connecticut. Uh, and this, again, because she wrote it in French, uh, has never been discussed by American literary critics, only by French literary critics. And the French literary critics view her years in America as just a kind of an exile in a wasteland where there could have been nothing of any interest to her, a very French view of the United States. But in fact, uh, this Memoirs of Hadrian uh, was inspired largely uh, as much by America as by anything else. She has a little afterward to the novel in which she talks about starting to write the novel while she's taking a train uh, from New York out to the American Southwest through Chicago. Closed inside my compartment as if in a cubicle of some Egyptian tomb, I worked late into the night between New York and Chicago. Then all the next day in the restaurant of a Chicago station where I waited a train blocked by storms and snow. Then again until dawn, alone in the observation car of a Santa Fe limited train surrounded by black spurs of the Colorado mountains and by the eternal pattern of the stars. Thus were written at a single impulsion the passages on food, love, sleep, and the knowledge of men. I can hardly recall a day spent with more ardor or more lucid nights. Uh, and so her, her most important novel is written while actually literally crossing the American landscape, thinking about it. And it enters American literature very soon in translation, which she helps uh, her life partner Grace Frick uh, translate night by night. Furthermore, uh, Yersenar herself was actually an American citizen by the time she wrote this book, and it enters American literary space, and yet it's always been ignored by American critics only because this is a translation that gets published in the United States. Uh, but she, you know, she supervised the translation too. It's also her work. It becomes a bestseller. It stays on the New York Times bestseller list for five months until it's gradually edged off by a combination of one French novel and translation, Bonjour Tristesse by Françoise Sagan, uh, and then The Confessions of Felix Kuhl, Confidence Man by Thomas Mann, a German novel, and then one American novel, a war novel, No Time for, for Sergeants. Uh, but my, uh, my argument is, not only it becomes a work of American literature, but it also influences American literature, much as Las Casas influenced Milton, because uh, Nabokov's Lolita was in press was being ready to be published at the time that Memoirs of Hadrian became a bestseller. And it had to have paved the way for the success of Nabokov's next novel, his other most famous and best novel, Pale Fire, published a couple years later, which is itself the memoir of an exiled king talking about uh, his lost love. You have also a similar uh, gender-bending gay theme in both, in both cases. So the Memoirs of Hadrian becomes part of American literature, influences American literature, but because of its original French uh, composition, it has been almost entirely ignored <coughs> by Americanists. Uh, and I think not just she was writing it while she was going across the United States, but coming to the United States gave her an impression of a huge and multi-ethnic space that really helped her think about the Roman Empire, which looks much more like America than it looks like France. That she, had, that she had come from. Uh, and finally, a, a little set of examples uh, to um, come a little closer to, to home. Uh, I've been getting interested in the Georgian national epic, uh, Shota Rostovelli's Night in the Panther Skin. Uh, it's interesting because how many people know the name of Rostovelli who are here? I see four, five, six. So it's interesting, and it's not very far away, Georgia. Uh, this is like famous. Uh, so if you have the statue of Nizami here, the same thing is the statue of Rostovelli downtown uh, in Tbilisi, just next to the McDonald's. So you have, uh, you have that. Now what's interesting from this point of view about Rostovelli, so this gets adopted as, as the sort of foundational national epic. This is the first really important work in Georgian, uh, really important literary work, uh, great poem. Uh, and, and it's really seen as, oh, this is, this is the, the national uh, poet, the early national poet of, of Georgia. But it is based very strongly on Persian literature. Uh, uh, and uh, here's a little description of the Knight in the Panther skin from around the year 1200 uh, in the CE. The poem is placed far away from Georgia in countries the poet has never visited, Arabia, India, and China. The indications are vague and don't designate any particular site. It is a Georgian kingdom that has existed through these distant lands. His literary echoes the Shahnameh, Persian Ghazals, and, and a particular story of Laila and Majnun that he should have known through Nizami's version, which had just been written about 10 or 15 years earlier. 
Uh, but he also has connection to Arthurian romance, Chrétien de Troyes, Orlando Furioso. Uh, so Georgia, of course, uh, like Azerbaijan, is such a crossroads culture, right, sort of poised in between the, the Persianate world and the, and the European world, uh, both of which Rustavelli uh, knows. Uh, and he's very clear about this, that, that his debt to these traditions, for example, of, of Nizami, uh, particularly Laila and Majnun, is very important for him. Uh, Rustavelli talks in, in the beginning of his poem about his sources. I, Rustavelli, whose heart is pierced through by his sorrows, have threaded like a necklace of pearls a story told until now as a tale. I have found this Persian tale and have set it in Georgian verse. Until now, like a peerless pearl, it was rolled on the palm of the hand. Now, if you're familiar with the Guzzle tradition, you know that Guzzles are often described as being like a necklace of pearls. Each couplet of the Guzzle is like a pearl then strung on a necklace by the poet. Uh, and it's very interesting, Rustavelli, on the one hand, adopts this, he is aware of the Persianate heritage. Uh, he doesn't think of it as the Azerbaijani heritage of Nizami, as he perhaps should, but he's thinking of the language and living tradition. And he's making a certain claim, you know, like a peerless pearl, it was rolled on the palm of the hand. The, the Persian tradition is peerless, but somehow it's still just, it hasn't been put together yet. It's just pearl on the hand, right? He is making the necklace. That's, of course, what the poet does. You string the pearls in the necklace. So it's, it's a kind of a claim of indebtedness, but also even superiority to the Persian tradition, right? Now he's the one who's made the beautiful necklace that wasn't quite there. The, the Persians had it, but they didn't know how to put it together in a new way. Uh, you could compare this to Derek Walcott. If you're here this morning, the poem Volcano, he's sort of both showing his debt to Conrad and Joyce, but also saying, no, I'm the one who can read more carefully. I can make a better, a better poem myself. Uh, and I think that you could see, uh, he goes on, uh, describe his story, Rustavelli. In the Arabic tongue, a lover is called a madman, a sort of majnun comes, the, 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 the sort of hero goes mad for love. It really means the, the madman, the possessed, because of non fulfillment and futile longing for his beloved. Rostavan ruled in Arabia, and Rostavan is his hero, really Rostam, out of the Shaname, is what we're talking about here, but he's now an Arabian king, a monarch exalted, mighty, fortunate, noble, far seeing, wise in counsel uh, and, and judgment. Uh, now, understanding this work of national, foundational work for Georgian national tradition requires us to understand how worldly, how international it is. There's a recent book, book just coming out now about this by a guy named Harshal Ram, uh, who is a critic for Indian extraction, who works in this area, who works in Georgian literature, and he teaches in Berkeley. And he's and talking about Tbilisi or Tiflis. Uh, he says the Georgian past is perhaps best read as a layered palimpsest of social and cultural interactions revealing the traces of subnational affiliations, supranational pressures, as well as the modern project of nation building. In exploring the multiple cosmopolitan affiliations enacted by the literary and cultural practices of Tiflis, I am consciously rejecting the more familiar strategy of privileging, privileging national particularism as a primary unit of analysis. Without wishing to deny or underplay the significance of Georgian nationalism as a counter to Russian imperialism, I shall return repeatedly to the cosmopolitan as a category that complicates the simple binarism of nation <coughs> and empire. Uh, and I think uh, there's a nice quote that I like that I found from the Transcaucasian Herald, 1847. I think this kind of, and keeping in mind, I have at least read that Nizami himself was writing what some scholars call a Transcaucasian kind of Persian. So we have also Transcaucasian, both Persian, but also going into these other languages, including Georgian. And the Caucasian Herald says Tiflis is somewhat akin to Janus, using a Roman uh, analogy. It's one face fixed on Asia, the other looking to Europe. And this is in Tbilisi, one of the new bridges uh, recently, recently built. And just a final example of how this goes on into contemporary literature, we can think of Orhan Pamuk, uh, the na My Name is Red, uh, the Beni Madin uh, Kirmitsi, uh, perhaps his most famous novel, or one of his most famous novels. Uh, and what interests me, and this goes back to this question, I think I even mentioned this case this morning, but here's an illustration of it, uh, of how it gets translated. And I, if I had uh, an Azerbaijani translation, I would show that. I, I don't. Yeah, I assume there probably has been one by now, and if so, I'd love to have a, a picture of, of this in Azerbaijani. <coughs> but so this gets translated into English uh, as uh, My Name is Red. And you can even see that the, uh, the cover has sort of playing off this original cover. You have you have a one eye scene now, turn this one eye here, you have the horse, you have the horse, 
uh, but it's now made different. The, the American audience needs more red on the cover because it's supposed to be My Name is Red. Uh, so it's a little bit more literalized and a little bit more orientalized. Right? This one is very modernist. But it's a very modern looking woman. Now this becomes very archaic and orientalist. Of course, it is a historical novel. It's set back in this period, but you, you see a different, a different choice. Uh, now, what's interesting from this, uh, given that Pamuk is very interested in, in Persian traditions, and he's, he's playing on Nizami, he's playing on Shahnameh, uh, a, a, a variety of, of, of texts, but especially he's interested in, in the Persian artistic tradition, Persian miniatures, as well as these Persian literary analogies. You then get the Persian translation. Uh, this is the Persian translation. There's Orhan Pamuk, uh, and uh, the name in, in uh, Farsi, as I understand. Very interesting, I think. Uh, the illustration, uh, I was asking my household, gee, I wonder what, what that book is. It turns out it is the Turkish original, not just that, taken from this photo of Pamuk reading it. If you look very closely, it's actually literally this photo they've taken of him reading the Turkish original, and they used that on there. But now, uh, according to my, my uh, uh, friend Ana uh, Sherevani in Iran, it was not translated from Turkish. It was translated from English. Uh, and the, the English intermediate is now suppressed by the Persian translation that wants you to think you're reading, you know, the same thing Pamuk is reading when he's reading his own original, right? But actually you're reading a translation uh, of a translation. Uh, and this is now, uh, my, my point would be that this is now, if Pamuk's novel becomes uh, really widely read and accepted, and Pamuk is certainly a, an author they're very aware of there, it becomes part of uh, Farsi literature. Uh, in the same way that Las Casas became part of English literature, Margaret Yersenar became part of American literature, never recognized by the critics because we're always the last to know, uh, but we should get beyond that, reproducing the unthinking linguistic nationalism of 150 years ago. It's about time uh, to get past that and understand that works to take on an effective life in a new language can become part of that, of that, uh, of that literature. Uh, so. Uh, my concluding point is, is just that examples as, as disparate as, as Las Casas, Yorsenar, Nizami, uh, 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 Rustavelli, and Pamuk himself uh, show us the, the inevitable worldly quality of our national traditions. Thank you. I will now drink some chai, a word that comes like this substance from India and China. <laughs> and it's even funny how foods become nationalized or denationalized. Like <clears throat> I always used to think of um, tomatoes as, as an Italian food, tomato sauce, and of chocolate as Swiss or Belgium, the, uh, potatoes as Irish. Every one of these substances was unheard of in Europe until the conquest of America. They're all from uh, from the Americas, and even the, name, the very names that we have in English, at least, potato, tomato, these are old Aztec names that were adopted over. It's just like, just like the chai uh, that, that we drink, that will now be a nice Azerbaijani name, is really Chinese and then Indian uh, substance. So questions, comments? I'm sorry I'm losing my voice, but I'll retain enough of it to... Well, any questions? Uh, by the way, just, we highly appreciate your... Welcome to our university. Uh, I have read your article, and actually my question about your article, that was very interesting. And when I read this, um, I saw that you have mentioned on your article, in 16th century, the Spanish and the French romances were outnumbered um, London's bookseller shop. Why? What was the reason of it? And I wanted to ask that, uh, does this factor uh, does this factor have the impact of the modern literature to the modern literature, and what kind of fact, uh, in effect I want to say? Absolutely. Um, so it may be hard to re remember now, but in the 16th century, England was this really peripheral, small island, relatively poor, uh, relatively third-rate power that had big ambitions to become a first-rate power. And the real cultural centers of authority in Europe at the time were Paris and Madrid. So uh, very much 
as today, still under globalization, <coughs> you don't have, you may have a something like a world system, but as my friend Franco Moretti says, a world literature, the system is one but unequal. And, and centers of literary power uh, have more attention. Their works flow to the periphery more readily than works go from the periphery up. So at that time, England was a peripheral power, uh, and mostly what people wanted to read was French and Spanish literature. So there would be more French text, more Spanish text in the London bookstores than there would be British text, because those are the prestigious things. So just as you would find more, even today, French or American bestsellers in a bookstore here, then you would find Georgian works, and possibly even more, more than the Azerbaijani works in terms of numbers of sales, possibly, though <clears throat> thanks to a, a, a more kind of national sense of importance of local production that may be, may be protected. But the same basic pattern uh, was already there. Uh, and translations often flow downstream, and they always have. There will always be more translations from the cultural center to the periphery than from the periphery up to the cultural center. And this is true in the ancient Near East. For example, there are, there are substantial evidence of translation from Babylonian literature into peripheral literatures. Uh, Edomite, Hittite in Anatolia, uh, 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 um, uh, Aramaic. There's, there's no evidence of translation up from those languages to Babylonian. It just goes that way. Uh, yes, now, Mr. Berkenthal University. I am from English Language and Literature Department, Milana Seyitada. My question is just out of the lecture, maybe, but it's uh, about your own life. Uh, how, um, how can you say, which kind of difficulties did you face in order to come to this position? And what is your advice for us in order to make better our education path? That's, uh, I'm trying to give a short-ish answer to that. Um, I think the, the challenge often is to, to, to follow your interests in a way that really matters to you and where you can do something distinctive and different while also kind of connecting to an audience uh, and ideally a <coughs> job market. Uh, my problem as a student was I got interested in all these sort of eccentric things. Uh, I mean, not only mainstream writers, <coughs> the European novelists, but I got really obsessed with Aztec poetry, Old Norse, uh, Icelandic literature. Uh, and just, I was falling in love with these things, and more than once I studied a language in order to be able to read better the, the poetry. But then it was a challenge. Well, how was I going to find an audience, get a job? Uh, and, I, and I particularly, you know, realized I didn't actually want to spend my entire life, say, on ancient Near Eastern literature, mostly because there isn't enough of it. I mean, what's there is very, very good, but there are only a few really major Babylonian texts, for example, or and, and Egyptian, which I was studying Egyptian already in college, but there's not very much. The entirety of Egyptian literature, ancient Egyptian literature, will fit in one volume of about <coughs> 300 pages, everything you might want to read. So not enough to spend your life on as a literary scholar. So I was entered in comparative literature. My own advisors didn't quite know what to make of it. Um, I, I think that uh, they were not sure I would get any kind of a job. Uh, one of my, <coughs> my director of graduate studies at a certain point said, well, um, uh, maybe some hiring committees would worry, and that meant he worried, that I would be seen as just doing arabesques around the tradition. And I thought that term was very interesting, arabesques, right? It was somehow not Judeo-Christian-esque enough. You know, and the tradition should mean, you know, French and German and English. At the time I was doing my PhD at Yale in the late 70s, half of all dissertations being done in the department had one or more chapters on Balzac or Henry James or both. Half of all the dissertations. It's not a wide range. And I had these weird interests. I, my dissertation had a chapter on ancient Egypt, a chapter on rabbinical midrash, and a chapter on James Joyce. So what do you do? Uh, I had to decide as I got into it, uh, my strategy has been to try to, the, sort of the more unusual interests that I have, um, I'll try to hang that on to something better known, uh, where for which is more of an audience. So I might have written an entire book on the Epic of Gilgamesh, a Babylonian epic that I'm very, very interested in, <clears throat> but I didn't have enough training to have the authority to be a full-time Babylonian specialist and didn't want to anyway. And if I'd written a book at that time on Gilgamesh, I would have had a lot of trouble getting published at all, 
and if it had it, very few people would have read it. So instead, I, I was very interested in, in, in biblical narrative, and I decided to write, I really love the Bible, I'm very interested in these narrative patterns. I wrote a book on the Bible, for which there's much more audience, and I had one chapter on Gilgamesh in that. Or again, with the Aztec material, Mesoamerican material, uh, I loved it, but again, I didn't, there's not that much poetry, I didn't want to spend my whole life on it. Uh, and again, just publishing an Aztec poetry, very few people read that language, and almost none of them care about literature anyway. So you'd have a subset of a subset, three people would have read a book on that. Uh, so instead, I figured out over time, the broader issues I was interested in, of translation and empire, uh, and then first published one article on the aesthetics of conquest uh, in a kind of renaissance magazine, a journal. <clears throat> And then later in my book on, on uh, what is world literature, I have a chapter there. So I'm connecting to general interest. Uh, so I think that's a good strategy. And, I, and as much as I think it's very liberating to realize you don't have to only write about the, the few authors that everybody else has been writing about. It's actually much more open if you can begin to look into new areas. But then you do have to hang it on to something for which there's a known uh, audience, I think. As an Chernobyl second year student, uh, I would like to know what can be done by us, uh, I mean by students, uh, to ensure that we promote uh, world literature. Well, um, this goes uh, somewhat to the theme in the other article I sent, for those who saw it, um, that, um, what did I call it, comparative world literature. <coughs> and my theme in that article was that uh, too often, I think, that American literature, American comparative and world literature, <coughs> talks about anything other than America. It's, it's just out there. Uh, whereas, conversely, often comparative literature elsewhere is very, very nationalistic. Uh, and either is talking about us and Paris, us and New York, <coughs> uh, very often. And this is in many parts of the world or just us and ourselves. And, and then if we're in China, oh, it's the greatness of Chinese comparative literature to show how great Chinese literature is because it uses these foreign materials so well, or it's being read with such interest in Paris. Uh, and so it means that uh, you have the irony whereby, let's say in China, they say, oh, why are our novels now not better known uh, in, in Europe or in the United States? But they, on the other hand, are doing the very same thing in their own region. They're not paying any attention to Vietnamese literature or Thai literature. They're not learning those languages. They're not reading, right? So they're kind of reproducing the same uh, thing. To me, we need a better balance in that a really good promotion of world literature will connect to the national tradition, to the audience where you are, and push them outwards. This is what seems to me really important. Uh, I also think that studying languages is really important. Um, as I'm a big proponent of the value of reading and translation, but ideally my utopian goal when I teach world literature is that I hope that every student in the class unpredictably will be inspired to study some language they never needed to know before because they'll fall in love with something. It's happened to me more than once, <coughs> as with the Aztec stuff. I mean, a good example of that, uh, the reason I got interested in Aztec poetry uh, was as a freshman in college, I took a art history survey course just a straight Western art history survey course, the Greeks up to the Renaissance. Uh, uh, but my particular instructor, who had been stuck to do the course as an assistant professor, uh, was uh, a specialist in Mesoamerica, Mexico, Guatemala, <coughs> Mayan and Aztec. And he put in a week on that, just because he could. Uh, and I got very interested in, in, some, in a statue that he had shown. I wrote a, my little term paper on this as a freshman. I wasn't doing real research or very much. But it was very puzzling, mysterious statue, very powerful, huge woman with her head cut off and replaced by serpents and necklaces, of skulls. I thought, what's going on? And I came upon a, a very interesting book called Aztec Thought and Culture that used a lot of poetry, of the classical Aztec poetry, to sort of explain the thought world. Uh, and I thought this poetry was so beautiful that if I ever got the chance, I would like to know it better and then maybe try to learn the language. Now, this is interesting because this was an English translation of a Spanish Scott study, a Mexican scholar writing in Spanish, with his translation of the Aztec Nahuatl original. So it's a translation of a translation. And even in translation translation, it impressed me so deeply 
Four years later, as a graduate student, I found a course being offered in the language, and I decided to take it. The enrollment doubled when I signed up. There had been one person, now there are two. My director of graduate studies threatened to throw me out the window when I asked for credit, but he did let me take it. It was not bad, but it was on the seventh floor, so it was a little uh, da dangerous at the time, but he did let me take, take the course. Or another example, my, my middle kid, I was mentioning at lunch to some people, um, she changed schools when she was going to go to high school uh, in order to go to a high school where she could study Japanese. It's not an obvious thing for a kid in Brooklyn to want to do. We have no heritage background or anything. But the reason for that was that in third grade, her class had gone to a Japanese tea ceremony, and she was obsessed by it. She thought she'd like to study Japanese. She changed schools. She studied Japanese for four years. She went to Japan for two summers, all because once they went to a tea ceremony. And, and these things are for me, you know, you never know what will affect things. But if you actually really introduce students to a wide range of material, something will click with somebody. If, as long as it's something that you love and are interested in. I would never teach something if I could help it out of a sense of mere obligation. One nice thing about comparative literature, world literature, is you have so much to choose from. You can find stuff that you get passionately interested in. But the other side of that is I think you, it's always better if it connects to your culture, to where your students are, you know, I think it's, it's good to have a, a, a healthy balance uh, of, of, the, of the national and the international uh, in the world literature course. Uh, hello, I'm Rahima Khalili, Department of English Literature and Teaching. Uh, it's just a simple question, but I wonder who is your favorite writer and why? Um, there are probably too many favorite writers to answer. Um, <coughs> The advantage of being a comparatist is like, you know, there's so many good writers for different reasons. So, uh, I don't know, for a long time, uh, James Joyce, uh, Ulysses, and Finnegan's Wake, I was obsessed by. Uh, uh, Marcel Proust, uh, Recherche de Temps Perdu. Uh, Murasaki Shikibu, Tale of Genji, written in the Middle Ages, the greatest work by a woman before the modern era. If you haven't read it, uh, you must read it. Uh, the Book of Job in the Bible. Uh, so, I mean, that's the, the problem, that there, there's so many that are, uh, and that they, my favorite writers will bring me into a wholly different world, uh, and that will, you know, uh, I, I'm not interested very much in works that are only interesting to think about, they, they have to be really moving to read, uh, the language has to be beautiful, which can even just be in a, in a good translation, the language can be beautiful. And, and I think it's, uh, it's that combination of a sense of uh, excitement of discovering a different world, which can be a world within one's own country, I tend to find uh, the most uh, excitement of that discovery sort in something that's far away and thinking, this is so far and yet it feels so close to home. Maulana Mamizade, Department of English Language and Literature, postgraduate student. So um, my question is, so you studied uh, comparatively many literary works. So I wonder, so what was uh, special interesting so in your investigation? I mean, just uh, comparing what literature to what literature? Well, I think um, at different times, different, different things. Uh, let me give you two examples. I mean, one more academic and one less. Well, let me take one example. One of the works I've, one of, one of my favorite works that I've worked the most on is, is this epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, the greatest uh, ancient Mesopotamian work by far. And I worked on it on several different periods of my life. There was this early chapter in my first book. At, at that point, I was doing it very much as a kind of uh, adventure story. At, any of you know the Epic of Gilgamesh? Some people familiar with it? This you'll know. Uh, you know, this quest for immortality. You have a kind of a buddy romance road movie of Gilgamesh and Enkidu. <coughs> But I came back to it a few years later, I mean, a few years ago, many years later. Uh, well, then I wrote about it in my book on what is world literature. Uh, and from that, I got very interested in the kind of adventure story of its recovery. But then after 9-11, after in particular, the sort of World Trade Center episode, I got very uh, upset by the stupid discourse developing in the United States about a clash of civilizations. I thought, this is so stupid. Uh, and not, not helpful. Uh, and I thought, what do I know about that maybe I wish the general American public would know about to think differently? And I thought, all right, the general public needs a, a book on the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, 
Now, the general public did not know it wanted a book on the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, but I like that because this is a great ancient classic that has offshoots that go up into Homer. Is, Gilgamesh is like, rather like Odysseus, goes into the Bible where you have the flood story, goes into Thousand One Nights. There's a Gilgamesh version in the Thousand One Nights. So it shows if you go back far enough, it's one civilization. It's not this stupid I, Manichaean idea uh, that you were hearing in the American press in the early 2000s. So I wrote this book for a general public. And then I had the challenge, this partly goes back to how do you promote world literature. You know, if you're talking about great masterpieces of your own national tradition or the regional tradition, you have the advantage that you can sort of expect people to know who you're talking about. At least they know something. If you're talking about really something more distant, then you have the challenge but also the, the ex pleasure of trying to think how to lead people into something distant from them. In the case of this for popular audience, I was writing, I know for people who would never have really heard of Gilgamesh, would not know what cuneiform writing was, you know, very basic things. Uh, and so I decided to do it backwards in time. I wrote a backwards history. My uh, metaphor that I used was like an archeological site. On top is the more recent stuff, and the further down you dig, you get back to the earlier stuff. So I started with the adventure story in the 19th century of the Europeans who dig up Nineveh and find the manuscript, the, the tablets of the epic. And then he went back down in later chapters to Assyria itself, then back down to Babylonia, then back down to the historical Gilgamesh at the end. And then it came back home with contemporary world literature uses of, uh, of Gilgamesh. Uh, so this was a case of finding a strategic way to lead my readers into the distant past from where they were uh, to begin with. First of all, thank you for your coming. My name is Afak. I'm a master's student of English and uh, English language and literature department. I wanted to know uh, one thing. You, uh, before you uh, just mentioned about the uh, audience, yeah. I wanted to know What's the difference between Harvard University audience and Kafka's University audience? And if you were uh, in Harvard University, you were giving this lecture in Harvard University, what would be the difference? The same le lecture, but in a different audience, so not in Kafka's, but in Harvard. What would be the difference? Um, uh, the more of the Harvard students would be checking their cell phones while I was lecturing. <laughs> I'm not looking at this person checking their cell phone while well, I'm lecturing. Uh, this is just a question period. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge with the Harvard students. They are so obsessed with multitasking. Uh, so I don't know if that's true here or not. Uh, I, don't, I, I see more people looking directly at me than looking down at something uh, than I would <coughs> necessarily at Harvard. Uh, so that's, that's perhaps one difference. Um, you know, I know, I mean, the diff there is a, a difference in context because, of course, I, if I give a version of this lecture as I have at, at a university at, at home, I know within the American context and my kind of complaints about the, the, uh, the American lack of interest in the foreign, uh, this is something more likely that the Americans just haven't thought about. I think that, uh, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, uh, that here you know this is a crossroads culture. You know everything is coming in and you're interacting constantly with that. So I think that should be less of a surprise uh, here. Uh, although there's also a different thing because I think here, um, and, and, and that's why I was interested to ask if anyone had heard of Rustavelli, you have something in this situation of uh, being more knowledgeable about literature in Paris than literature just across the nearest border. Uh, and, and that seems to me uh, an interesting distinctive fact that so there's probably slightly different challenges here than there. It's also different in that the Americans have a kind of uh, uh, inherent, at least superficially, very um, amenable, very hospitable to the idea of world literature because Americans are very proud of being a nation of immigrants. Uh, and of having so many languages and cultures from around the world <coughs> represented. I mean, in my hometown of New York, there's something like 180 or 200 languages are spoken on the street, and just sort of as a matter of course. Uh, so here we have a somewhat uh, different, uh, different situation there, too. So I'd be ad adjusting somewhat uh, to um, you know, the, the idea that 
In America, the national philology was always a weak tradition. You'll have to argue against that. In America, I have to argue more for we should pay more attention to American literature in comparative studies. Here, probably, it's the opposite, that the national uh, uh, philology is more important, and the, pro the process of nation building through literature is extremely important uh, in a number of countries that have often been <coughs> under some other empire. You see it in Slovenia very much. You see it in Georgia. You see it here. Uh, and I think this has to be understood, and then that is something you use and build on. Uh, and the, the danger to saw is to kind of keep, keep people from pulling back and only reading Azerbaijani literature or, <coughs> or you know, a couple of things close to it, and then missing uh, all sorts of other relations that are actually circulating right, right there in the literature. On which literature? Well, I'm but, curious which Turkish writers have you ever read, and uh, which one was your favorite? Uh, well, uh, Pamuk is my favorite uh, Turkish writer of my relative uh, limited knowledge of, of Turkish, uh, and he's, he's become the best known, of course, uh, Turkish contemporary writer probably in the world, <coughs> and certainly in the US, uh, where he's been so well translated uh, and became very, very popular. Um, and then there's a, uh, actually, uh, you know, so there's a, I have a particular sense of, of fondness uh, for, for Pamuk. And of course, you always had this interesting thing that sometimes the writers who are most successful abroad are writing more foreign literature than the, than the ones who are not <coughs> as easily legible right away. Though I think also when you have a success like that, it can open the way for more writers and a greater <coughs> variety of writers. So there are now more Turkish writers being, for example, translated and published in America, partly thanks to Pamuk's success. More editors are looking, looking for that. Uh, but I also have, uh, in our World Literature Anthology, a number of earlier Turkish poets, uh, Nadim and uh, uh, Fuzuli. And I was also interested in some of the travel writing and, and uh, sort of works on, 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 on Europe by earlier Turkish writers. <coughs> and then, of course, you have how Turkish are some of these writers, uh, or you know, uh, the great uh, 19th century Ghazal poet who does, uh, uh, Ali, uh, who, who writes in Urdu and Persian, was said to be of Turkish uh, extraction. So it's also a question of how do you identify someone nationally or, <coughs> or ethnically if they're a generation removed from where their family came from or, or, or not. So, uh, but uh, Pama could be my, my vote, uh, my personal acquaintance. Senior student of uh, English language and literature department, Mariam al -Madaba. Maybe my question is far from uh, out of the topic, uh, but what uh, what took my uh, attention is um, each book uh, which is translated into English language is changed its cover as well. Does it really matter? What is there any specific reason? For example, I haven't read uh, Margaret. Your sonar. Your, your canar, yeah. Memories of Hadria. Firstly, I saw uh, original book and it was described some words there. And I thought that, yeah, it's about maybe memories of um, memories of a girl in some nature or uh. something like this. But now I see uh, English translation, um, a thoughtful man. No, I think that it, it's about memories, um, about something else. But it really matters. For example, or or Hampamuk, my name is Red. Contemporary things uh, it, uh, was described on original um, book, but uh, Ottoman Asian Ottoman garment is described in English mm -hmm. translation. What's your opinion about it? Does it really matter? I think it really does. Um, you know, we always are told not to judge a book by its cover. We have that saying in English, but actually people do. Publishers put a lot of effort into the covers because they think people will judge it by the cover. Uh, the French critic Gérard Genette uh, talks about the paratext and how important it is. Everything that surrounds the actual text, uh, which can be the table of contents, it can be an introduction, it's the cover, it's the back cover, what's on the back. It, it does shape, even just 
is it called a novel or is it called a memoir that already sets your expectations for what you're reading in a profound way. And I'm very interested in the kind of cultural politics of how the works trans are, 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 are uh, circulated in translation, and the covers are often very interesting. I'm particularly interested in the cases where the, it seems to me, the sort of heritage of Orientalism is so strong that you can get an Orientalizing edition even by people who think they're anti-Orientalist. Uh, a good example is the Moroccan writer that I got interested in um, was the Moroccan writer Tahar Ben Jaloun, contemporary Moroccan writer, very good writer. Writes in French, one of these Moroccan uh, intellectuals who writes literature in French. Uh, and I looked at translations of a couple of his works. So they're published, and it's interesting, so, uh, they're published in, in Paris in, in very um, uh, sort of simple, uh, very uh, sort of Parisian, is making it very French. Uh, so he has a novel called Partir, uh, which is like leaving uh, or to leave. Uh, and it's a very simple thing. And on the back, a kind of very poetic meditation, just a quote taken out of, out of the novel. So you have just a plain cover with the word Partir. and the back, you have a, a beautiful quote from the novel about leaving uh, Algiers. Uh, and then the English translation, the American translation, is called Leaving Tangiers, so they're going to make it more specific. But on the back, it's all about, this is like the Arabian Nights today. So it's an Orientalist. So on the one hand, it's making it, so the, the French one is kind of existential, nowhere in the world, just partir. The American one makes it both more local, but also more Orientalist. So, and I think, you know, that profoundly shapes it, both, it. It at least tells you a lot about the market as understood by the publisher, and probably also about how it actually is getting read. So I think that that's a whole subject to study. It's often very, very interesting. People think about America uh, in mid-century, in which case you want the American. Uh, so in my ideal world, you'd have two or three translations of the play that both the cover, but then ev even the language, right? How do you represent that kind of speech? How foreign do you want it to be? How local? How Azerbaijani do you want it to be? And I think you have, any translator has a, a bunch of interpretive possibilities and a kind of even ethical responsibility. Uh, that either way, you want to do justice to the work in a way that makes sense and gives it an expansive meaning and not a limited meaning. But that could be under either strategy. Thank you. And my last question. It's last. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. And there's another hand behind that. So. Go ahead. I have watched a lecture of. Uh, one professor, I'm sorry, I couldn't remember his name, from uh, University of Florence. He gave, uh, he gave a lecture about um, what distinguishes English uh, novel from other language, our, uh, other nations not novel. Uh, the specific um, peculiarities what distinguish English novel from other nations novel. So he said that love and marriage are the main theme of English novel. What about American? What about American novel? Is there any, are there any spe specific peculiarities that distinguish American novel from other English, other nations novel? Well, that would definitely depend on the period you're talking about. Uh, and it was the period of uh, Victorian age. Yeah, I think the American novels were tending at that point to be very much trying to look for American themes and not just imitate the English as they'd been doing. So you have Fenimore Cooper, and even Edgar Allan Poe, Melville. I think they're, they're looking for local themes uh, very much. Um, and then you also start to get writers like Mark Twain who become interested in American dialect, vernacular American English. So that's also another, another trend that you have. Then you also get novels that will be very much oriented towards American social issues, whether it's Harriet Beecher Stowe and uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And, and I think generally some difference of a, a greater sense of uh, a popular audience and a little bit less connection to elite audience. And of course, they're just not interested in aristocracy as a class, the way a lot of British novels still in the 19th century are about class relations that, that remain very strongly marked uh, in England to this day, much more than they were in America at that day. Mr. Tamsho, my name is Orhan Talzadeh from Turkish Language and Literature Faculty. Uh, I'm doing my master's and I'm kind of a busy human 
not as busy as you, but <laughs> uh, and recently I read a novel from Elif Shafak, Support the Rules of Love, which is published in English in America, and it was very popular in our country as well. And uh, I don't know if you have read this novel. I have not. Uh, uh, I know the name, but I haven't read it. Yes, okay. But I'm curious uh, how about your time management. How are you finding time to read something because you are very busy at the moment? I have the problem that I'm an email addict. Uh, I have trouble staying away from the email. Um, one of the things I have to tell my students and when I'm lecturing is that I'll make a deal with them, which is that I will not interrupt my lecture to check my email if they don't do that either. Uh, I don't always win this bet. Um, it's hard, um, and I don't read as much as I'd like to, um, partly because I'm doing a lot of administrative stuff as well. but. Um, uh, if I need to really write, I have to just force myself to stay away from the email for several hours at a time. It's possible to do. It takes takes work. Uh, and then the evening is a nice time for me for, for actual just reading. Well, thank you all thank for you your attention. Thank you, Thomas. I would ask you to read the entire to, if you don't mind, you would like, to, you like our dean to present you a gift, ah. a memory of our, from our university. The second one is uh, the art of last night. Ah, yes. They were playing this last night. Yes, tolerance. Yes, Azerbaijani nation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And we invite our Jelly Bay to the Red Location University. This is the art Ebru that we hope we will take you there. Thank you. And Jelly Bay to the New York City. Now uh, we would like to invite our guests to the stage to take photos together. Thank you, students. All this time is up. You mean?